from the love of liberty in the fires of hope and prayer with boundless faith in our destiny we solemnly Almighty God, most beneficial and merciful, creator of the universe and embodiment of divine wisdom and light, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise. May your will be done in our nation as it is in the heavens. Please bless our political leader, party officials, activists, and all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Give us the grace to always see good, be good, and do good, and the courage to serve the people. Protect us as we stand against injustice and iniquity, and inspire our endeavors to find the right solutions to the problems that are affecting our fellow citizens. Grant that we may always work together with humility and respect for the greater happiness of all and the honor and glory of our country. This is the Virtual Report, streaming on all platforms. Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our UNC Virtual Platform. I am Councillor Dubraj Pasad, and together with my UNC sister, Alderman Marsha Jaimangal Khan from the Penal Debe Regional Corporation, we will be taking you through this evening's proceedings. We are live on radio and TV Jagrati, Freedom 106.5, streaming on 91.9 Synergy TV, and all UNC social media platforms. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, we have a powerful lineup of patriots who will tell you how the opposition has been acting in your best interests. Our first speaker is a distinguished national athlete and who has been a fearless advocate for issues relating to youth, poverty, elevation, and social equity. He has represented Trinidad and Tobago since the age of 17, served as the captain of our national football team, chosen as Caribbean MVP several times, and was twice named National Player of the Year. Please welcome to the UNC platform 
a force of nature in the Senate, Senator David Nakid. Now it's time to take a stand, yeah. Come on! Cause this is the revolution, the people's revolution. This is the revolution. I wanna hear everybody sing. Everybody sing freedom. Man and woman sing freedom. Everybody sing freedom. Everybody sing. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Welcome to all of you at home, abroad, viewing us on our virtual platform. Special welcome to our political leader, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bisessa, and all those present. People of Trinidad and Tobago, as families, as villages, as communities, as a nation, we come together in achievement. Achievement in its various forms can be the social glue that inspires. It inspires those within our community to fulfill ambition, whether that ambition be on an educational path, or even a sporting path, or even an artistic path. I remember from my own childhood, my first remembrance of achievement, real, was when one of our neighbors, Edison Hack, lifelong neighbors, I recall vividly the first time that he got a scholarship to go to Mona, Jamaica to study medicine. I remember him leaving as a, boy, a young boy, I was about 10 years old. And I remember how the neighborhood came together. Mothers crying, fathers patting each other on the back, congratulating, congratulating Uncle Daniel. Everybody was so happy that this young man had achieved his dreams to go on to be eventually Dr. Edison Hack. He was a hero of, of everyone in that community. And I would dare say that his achievement was the impetus for almost 99% of the people on our street, first private road in Shafler, going on to tertiary education. It shows you how people can galvanize around achievement, how people can coalesce around achievement in ways that you, you can never imagine. I'll go one better. I remember I was about 11 years old, 1975, 1976, season West Indies in Australia. I would wake up in the morning completely without permission, get my brother's little blue radio to listen to the commentary. That time there was no live television. And I was listening to who? Roy Fredericks. Sorry to say Roy Fredericks was my favorite cricketer, still is. And I listened to Roy Fredericks, but what I consider, and many still do, to be the finest innings ever played in cricket. 169 against Australia at the time when they had Lily Thompson, Gilchrist, I mean, unbe Gilmore, yeah, unbelievable lineup. Second only they were to the West Indies own Holden and Roberts. I remember wanting to be a sportsman. But when I listened to the innings, and he was described, listen to me well, by the Australian commenta commentators, as this short black man who fearlessly decimated the finest bowling attack that Australia ever had. I remember the impact that had, that had on me. I swore at 11 years old, I would one day be a famous sportsman. It shows you what achievement can bring. I didn't become a cricketer. Although I promised uh, MP Dennis Shambali to show him a few things on Sunday. But I became a pretty famous footballer. It shows you what achievement can do. I say all of this to let you know that there is capacity in our communities. 
there is immense capacity in our communities. Across the board, in any path that you take, educational, artistic, sporting. But how do you reach that capacity? Capacity has to be met with opportunity. It has to be met with opportunity, and I mean real opportunity. And who gives opportunity? Only someone who cares gives opportunity. You can't give opportunity if you don't care. I can't tell you, well, I enjoyed watching Roy Federicks, and I want to be a great sportsman, but then work my tail off every morning down in Carib Field, or in Wasa Field, or in Mongto Field, to reach to be a great sportsman. It didn't happen like that for me, or for Latapi, or for York, or for Lara. But opportunity had to be there. And that's, why, well, that's where we come to the lack of opportunities that our boys in those same communities that we now see the fruits, or the rotten fruits, of a rotten policy implemented by Keith Rowley and this PNM government. They have not given our boys in those communities who have capacity, who have potential, who have ambition, who have yearning. This PNM government has not met that capacity with any opportunity. When Kamla Prasad Bisesa had all those programs in those communities, when she had learning skills, mentoring skills, programs to make sure that people were fed, that they could come to training, to the skill center, to the educational centers, ready to learn, ready to play. What did Rowley do? He discarded all of that. Such was his spite. Such was his hatred. And that is who we are dealing with essentially. We warned you, didn't we? The opposition has been warning you the last two years. At every turn, we told you about the lack of care that Rowley and this PNM government had for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and especially the communities that we now look upon and wonder, like Jacobs. Well, why is the crime like that? Why are these boys killing? Why are these boys doing that? You know why? You have not met their capacity with opportunity. You have met it with derision. One shot, one kill. You have met it with humiliation, face down on the ground. Not once did you give these boys a fair chance. So you didn't reach them with opportunity, but you're wondering how they have guns in their hands. If you don't put opportunity in their hands, you don't put programs, policies, scholarships in their hands, that gun, that cutlass, will reach to their hands. And then it comes at our door. And we're all left wondering, what are we going to do now? How are we going to correct this? Do you think Rowley, who didn't care before, who could pass by on his way to his house in Goodwood, a big billboard right opposite Massey, with 11 young men and women of China and Tobago missing two, three years. Not once has he commented on it. Not once. Not once did he comment on Andrea Barrett or Ashanti Riley. Not once did he comment on Simeon Daniel or Antonio Francois. And we have been saying it for two years. And what did he do? Never commented. Why? Because I said it before. These matters of human concern that ultimately ends up hurting us where, where people are now being killed indiscriminately. There's no, there's no secret or no wonder as to why people commit crime. People commit crime, as Aristotle said, Poverty leads to either of two things, revolution or crime. That's Aristotle. How many years ago? Thousand. Poverty leads to revolution or crime. Kamla Prasad Bisesa has given the people of Trinidad and Tobago the opportunity for a peaceful revolution. 
she has put people in place with the right policies, with the right programs, with the necessary care and compassion to reach the people of Trinidad and Tobago, to reach the people that matter, the people left on the fringes, the people on the margins of society. And what did we have? We had a media complicit with the PNM. We had a media who pushed the agenda of the PNM. Took this woman who cared and showed compassion out of, go out of government, and what we are left with? A legacy of Keith Christopher Rowley. The most uncaring, the most uncompassionate, the most hypocritical Prime Minister that we have seen in the history of the Caribbean. And that is no hyperbole, ladies and gentlemen. That is, that is just pure fact. Look at the statistics. Sport. Sport. That those programs in sport that enables our young men and women to find their path in life. Because I use sport to find my education. I saw so thousands of others in Trinidad and Tobago. What did Rowley do? Cut funding in sport. Not only that, and here's the part when we talk about real care. Because when I say achievement, achievement is not a pie in the sky. Achievement is something tangible. Achie achievement is something you can feel, you can taste. It's something you can embrace. So when I tell you, care about achievement, embrace it, work towards it, it's not something just idealistic. It's something that will eventually determine how we treat with those we want to bring into the mainstream of society. What did Rowley do? Give us a, prime, give us a minister of sport, Shampa Kojo, who knows nothing about sport. So what are we left with? We are left with with ministers in portfolios they have no understanding of. So Shampa Kajo will come now, as we see all over the place, small goal competition, competition in cricket. All of these things are what any counselor, what Eddie Hart could do, what, what Eddie Hart did for years. That does not bring a community forward in sport. Sports wants policies. Sports wants infrastructure. Sports want targeted, targeted programs. It wants leadership. That is what sports wants. And that's what we had under, under Kamala Prasad Bisasa. And that's why we had success, 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 success. Don't pay for one minute, one second, that those, our fine athletes who were successful recently, that this PNM government had anything to do with that. They had nothing to do with that. This was all success in spite of this PNM government. They cut funding for every single sport you can imagine. Our teams who have been training can't even fly abroad. Can't even fly abroad to partake in competition. While every single country, islands as small as Aruba, Curaçao, all of them participating in, 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 in all competition, CONCACAF under 14, under 15, boys, girls. PNM? No. No funding. They had to beg for a hockey team to come back. What does that tell you? Any government that cuts funding in sport, it means they do not care about the people on the fringes of society. So Rowley is a hypocrite in every, every, every sphere. So when he comes and talks about he cares for women and children, which I don't believe, or none of you do, because we've seen how he's acted towards women and children. When you come and you talk about you caring about women and children, there's a Judith Jones report on your desk for eight months. You have done nothing about it. Children still being abused. There was an economic recovery committee report with recommendations. You have done nothing about it. What do you care for, Rowley, other than your golf course or your personal life, which seems to be in a shambles? What do you care about? But if you are a man, Keith Rowley, if you are a real leader, Keith Rowley, you would, you would, and your care for the citizens who have paramount, paramount importance, whatever is happening in your personal life, you would be man enough to push that aside and say, you know what? The people of Trinidad and Tobago come first. My personal affairs, my personal issues, 
can take second place. Nobody want to come here and talk about your personal issues. But what are you doing in the interests of this country? Where are you? You are in hiding. Where is Ayanna Webster Roy? Is she hiding with you? We want to know where are you? Because our children are still suffering. So, I warned the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I warned you all before. We have a prime minister, and, I, and I, I stress the importance of understanding this. When we talk about care, and the newspapers just brushed it aside, when we talk about having a prime minister who truly loves the people of Trinidad and Tobago, whose every policy was targeted towards the people of Trinidad and Tobago, even that laptop policy that I saw David Abdullah today on the news, talking about how important that would have been to avoid the burden of having to pay for books. Just pain. You know how many people come into the, in the constituency of Tinapuna with their book list for me? Imagine the vision that Kamala Prasad Bissessa had in having that laptop policy where every child now would have had books online. They wouldn't have to bear that cost of books. David Abdullah talked about it today, but he never mentioned Kamala Prasad Bisesa because they don't want to admit that that woman had the vision. They don't want to admit that that woman had the compassion. They don't want to admit that that woman has the love. And that woman is the woman who is ready. She's ready to come into government. She's ready with the right people beside her to take this country forward again. She is ready, she is ready with not only the love and the care to implement, not words. Anybody could come and say, but how ah, you really care about my wife, boy? And every day you're lying with your partners all by the bar. You're not home taking care of your business. But I, that, is not my, that is not my area of expertise. You understand? I want the people to know that Kamla Pasal Bisasa, her care is one of implementation. Her, care is, her, her idea of care is making sure that policies are implemented. You can't implement it, find a new job. We've seen her do that. Not leave somebody like Fitzgerald Hines to have this place crime-ridden. Not leave somebody like Fitzgerald Hines to only come and bark at every East Indian you see all over the place. Not somebody like Fitzgerald Hines to say he don't care for the security and safety of people in China and Tobago. Not have Fitzgerald Hines not knowing what to do, to how to implement portfolios across the board to make sure that national security is implemented. We have a prime minister in Kamla Prasad Bisesa, ready, able, willing, compassionate to come into government, revive the healthcare, revive the education system that had 50% people failing under this PNM government. We have Kamla Prasad Bisesa, ready, willing, and able. Don't listen to the mainstream media. Kamala Prasad Bissessa is there. They know she's there. Now they're lamenting the fact. Read all the editorials. They're lamenting the fact they are, that they allowed Keith Christopher Rowley to take control of this country. But believe me, people of China and Tobago, I place my credibility, I place my life on it that this woman, Kamala Prasad Bissessa, will take this country forward to where we need to be. And I thank you, people of China and Tobago, loving the house all the time. Crying out for justice. Some of them crying out for freedom. Everybody crying out for democracy. Now it's time to take a stand. Yeah. Cause this is the revolution. The people's revolution. This is the revolution. I want to hear everybody. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Our next speaker is a well-known attorney and defender of the rights of the people. He continues to fight the oppression of this government, both inside and outside of the parliament. Please welcome the member of parliament for Shogwana's West, Mr. Dinesh Rambali. Yeah. 
Man and woman sing freedom Everybody sing freedom Everybody sing As we move in this people's revolution My brothers and sisters Let's all walk together as one This revolution is about restoring our democracy And this revolution is about stopping this creeping dictatorship Good evening ladies and gentlemen our Honorable Political Leader of the United National Congress, Mrs. Kamla Pasad Bisesa, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, my parliamentary colleagues, all of you who have gathered here, and those who have joined us virtually, good evening. And of course, let me say at the outset, it is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be able to address you all this evening in this our traditional Monday night forum. I would like to talk a little bit about Rowley Led government, this Rowley-led government, failing to protect the citizens, failing to protect us all from the criminal elements in this country. Now, after one of the bloodiest weekends in our history, where 14 homicides occurred in 72 hours, the failed Fitzgerald, Ethelbert Hines, addressed the nation today to talk about, you know what, cable theft. So you had him and you had the Attorney General coming to talk about cable theft today. No mention was made by Heinz of the body count over the weekend. That tells you, you have heard Senator David Nackett before, that tells you all you need to know about how Dr. Rowley and his PNM takes on crime. One of the victims of this weekend was one of my own constituents of Chaguanas West living in Charlieville a hard-working young man who had his life stolen from him by murderers who are now running rampant across this nation. Violent crime is now worse than it has ever been because we are living under a PNM government that is worst. It is the worst we have ever seen. Today, instead of addressing the families of the persons who were murdered over the weekend, Heinz came today to tell the nation that he's shutting down the scrap iron industry for the next six months, or for a six month period. How on earth, you tell me, is throwing the honest and hardworking scrap iron dealers, scrap metal iron dealers, on the breadline going to stop the thieves? That is like saying, and I know I, my brother took a job as well, that is like saying you're going to shut down special branch because you're vexed with one member of the special branch. Shutting down that industry, shutting down that industry for six months will only fuel the thieves. But this is the dotish logic of the Rowley-led PNM. But listen, this cabinet might be dotish, but they almost always have a motive behind everything which they wish to do and that is something that we must always be aware of. What they're going to do now is they're going to set up a cabinet subcommittee to grant export licenses for dealers. And you know who will be sitting on this subcommittee? A bunch of recusal ministers. So watch out for every minister's friend, every minister's family suddenly going to have a company exporting copper and iron. So while the country while your innocent friends and family, while they are going to find themselves in apprehension of greater fear, while the country drowning in bloodshed and more people now on the breadline, the Rowley-led cabinet will once again be looking out for their friends, family, and financiers. While scrap iron dealers suffering, the PNM will be eating our food. I want to now move on to another disaster that I saw this evening, this afternoon, in that press conference. So Heinz is one major disaster, but you have another disaster there that I saw this afternoon. And that disaster is the Attorney General. We have him there, Reginald Amor, Senior Counsel. He continues to be an embarrassment. And I don't mix those words very lightly, you know. Where did A.G. Amor resurface from? When last did you all see the Attorney General? You all remember who he is? He's the senior counsel who moonlights as a junior counsel. He's a senior attorney who moonlighted from time to time as a junior lawyer. First time I ever saw that was in this country under Rowley cabinet. 
Tonight I will repeat what I said recently in the parliament. AG Amor has no moral authority to hold the office of the Attorney General. You, AG Amor, you were disqualified by a court of law for stating an obvious untruth. And the public is bound to infer that you have lost your moral bearings. For someone in such office, such high office, your conduct was reprehensible. And what does that mean? When you have no moral authority, you have no substantive authority, legal or otherwise. The country cannot repose any confidence in you, and therefore you have shaken the public's confidence in the administration of justice in this country. And that is a serious problem. By the way, I want to ask the people of this country, has Reginald Amor Senior Counsel apologized to you as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago for speaking untruths on affidavit before the U.S. courts in a matter where he's representing you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago? And I heard somebody say it, the obvious answer, no, he has not. The arrogance of this office holder, Reginald Amor has only apologized to his friends who he grew up with in illegal fraternity. He has no time for you. He has no time for me. And he's only apologizing to some fellas who he grew up with and who view him as a good boy. That is what you're dealing with. So that was not an apology issued to you, the public. So he continues to disrespect all of us, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. But I want to give you all a warning. And this is another warning in addition to all that we heard our political leader, Mrs. Kamala Pasad Bisesa, speak about before. I must warn you that apart from any appeal pending before the Miami courts, forgetful Jones Amor will continue to find himself on the sticky end of court applications to stop him from acting in the proceedings. And that is something they are not telling you. The motion to disqualify, which was brought by Mr. Kwaitong and others, is but only one option among several available to them at this time. And it is this which they have chosen to exercise at this point in time. There are other options they can avail themselves of which is coming on. So apart from any success he thinks or may have been advised that he will enjoy on the appeal, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago can still find itself embattled by successive applications seeking injunctions made by the other side to prevent him from acting on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago. Not only will this prolong the proceedings in Miami, you know, the substantive proceedings, it will also delay the trial and inflict further legal costs which the taxpayers will have no choice but to pay. I want you all to bear with me a bit as I explain this further. Imagine most of us would go to lawyers, not only when we're in trouble, but we may have a land transaction, we want an advice, a deed poll, something like that, a uh, 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 um, statutory declaration. Imagine an attorney at law who has previously represented you comes and serves you a letter of demand in relation to a matter which he has intimate knowledge having previously acted on your behalf. Such conduct is generally seen as inappropriate and unethical. Why? Is a common sense piece of logic now. Because of the nature of the relationship between the attorney at law and you as the client. It is intimate. A client reposes trust and confidence in the attorney at law. There exists something called a fiduciary relationship with the client. And of all fiduciary relationships known to the law, the attorney-client relationship is one of the most recognizable and respected. What does that mean? The common law system of justice which we subscribe to in this country, a commonwealth country, could not function without it. The public, you and me and the public at large, derives its confidence because of the administration of justice from the fidelity, based on the fidelity of an attorney at law to his or her client. That is how important it is. So it is for this reason that courts have required high standards of propriety from an attorney at law. So if an attorney at law has knowledge of a case from one side and subsequently decides to jump ship to represent the other side, 
then armed with all of his knowledge of the intimate aspects of the prior case, a conflict of interest or a conflict of duty is bound to arise. To put it crudely, you cannot serve two masters. Conflicts of duty threaten these judicial standards. It is precisely these judicial standards that the public depends on for fairness and justice. And can we really ask, can we really risk shredding that to pieces? I don't know what you all say, but I say no way that will impact directly on our administration of justice. And that is the reason why courts have therefore intervened to restrain an attorney at law where a conflict of duty has possibly or certainly arisen. Courts will grant an injunction where there is a misuse of a client's confidential information or where there is a breach of an attorney's fiduciary duty or lo of loyalty or as part of what we call as lawyers the inherent jurisdiction of the court over its officers. What does it mean? If as an, a lawyer you are representing the other side, every time the matter reaches a stage where your previous client feels you are going to take a step and you are utilizing information which you got from them, confidential information, they are entitled to get an injunction from the court to stop it. So you see that disqualification motion? That is wrong one. It has several wrongs to come now because of what I am trying to explain to you tonight. Tonight does not permit me to go further into this topic. But the simple point is the Attorney General Amor continues to embarrass Trinidad and Tobago and to erode the public's trust and confidence in the administration of justice. And it is all being done at your expense. Yes, my friends, we are fitting the bill. We are paying for that as we speak. Do you think that is value for money when funds could have been better diverted for fixing all the bad roads? Paving roads, fixing landslips, unclogging drains, fixing river banks. This government does not see it that way. They are willing to, they are willing to spend millions of U.S. dollars on attorneys in America to untangle what I call a legal pretzel, which they crafted, self-inflicted, all by themselves without any proper basis for doing so. So they're spending your money to defend the indefensible. And I want to know tonight, and I'm asking Trinidad and Tobago, how do you all feel about that? So next time they tell you, the retrenching WASA workers, the next time they see you on the roadside and you're selling things that you never thought you would end up find, you know, finding yourself selling, I want you to understand the reasons why these things cannot get fixed and because your funds are going to U.S. attorneys to defend the indefensible. One of the topics I want to turn to very quickly because I saw A.G. Armour there today is fireworks. It is a trite law, and if you want to move away from that term, it is a matter of common sense that where a public authority, in this case the Ministry of Attorney General, embarks on consultation, it should do so properly. The consultation held last week, Friday, supposedly relating to fireworks, was a mockery of what is fair and proper consultation according to law. Participants were denied open and frank dialogue with the representatives of the Attorney General's office. Facebook only took the form of typed questions on a Facebook chat, and even then, they seemed to be somewhat selectively represented by the host. So the consultation started with a video which seemed more of a self-promotion tool as opposed to material upon which those who attended that platform could have considered and commented. So the Attorney General and his unit would do well to remember that a core tenet of democracy is governance through consent. Regulation of fireworks is a matter for which the population has been clamoring. We may disagree about the eventual or the, the ultimate form that it has to be regulated, but it is something nonetheless that the population has been clamoring for. Its unregulated use has incensed many in our society to such an extent that there is a call for an outright ban. Animal rights activists have expressed heartfelt and genuine concern over the cruel impact of fireworks on animals. So in such an environment, the consultation process held last Friday was extremely disappointing to many and in any event unsatisfactory. Senator Jolene John is here, our honorable deputy political leader. MP Inder Singh will address us in a little while and I recall and they will tell you 
that this government does not intend to hold proper consultations as they attempted to do so and to hoodwink people in the Tobago self-governance bill. That is something that when they came to the parliament, they could not convince Trinidad and Tobago that they had held proper consultations, first off with the Tobagonians and then with the Trinidadians. I call upon the AG, the Attorney General, to immediately correct the curtailed manner in which he has conducted these consultations. Get the facts and bring legislation accordingly. Failure to do so means any protest and criticism are leveled against the AG during the end of year firework season would be a condemnation he absolutely deserves. One of the things I want to tell you is that, before I close, is that over the last few days, and I don't know if they will have these slides to show, but over the last three, four days, and even beyond that, but we have seen some intense headlines over the last couple of days in our national newspapers. And I just want to refer, as they throw it up on the screen, open warfare. I want to say that today's Guardian opinion, this is their editorial. It is titled, Actions That Speak Softer Than Words. And this is what they say, the pervasiveness of the crime situation, and particularly murders today, persuades us once again that the government has no idea of how to control the mess that we have found ourselves in. This is the editorial of The Guardian. Here we are again, as we have done so many times before, using this space to echo the level of hopelessness that the majority of the population feels now, and a lack of confidence in the assurances being given by the authorities. So they are saying it squarely, rowly, you and your failed Minister Hines, you all have us in a desperate situation. They, are, they go on to deal with what I call the, the, the Commission of Police, whom I refer to sometimes as Captain Obvious. They should rename, give him a middle name, Duh. That is what they should call him. Having stated the obvious for the umpteenth time, we ask Mr. Jacob once again, what are you doing about it? Jacobs, do something, do your job. And they go on, you know, what may we ask had been empowering them long before this bill expired and they went on to deal with bail bill. Jacob still fretting over the bail bill. And so they're asking him, well, what happened when the bail bill was in force? How could you explain the success? There is none. But you still come in today and in this day and time to say bail bill was what is the cause of not what we're experiencing now. And this is very instructive. Eh? Listen to this. Criminologist Darius Figuera opines that the rules that the rules among criminals have gone, and that if this isn't reversed quickly, Trinidad and Tobago will enter into a state or anarchy similar to Haiti or Honduras. Listen to the countries who we are now being saddled alongside with. And you know, yesterday we were dealt with in our Sunday press conference, MP Rudy and Nursing and myself. In that press conference, I was talking about another aspect of crime, trafficking. And on that point, you know, in that U.S. Department of State report, when they put all of the countries according to what progress or lack of progress, as the case may be, in human trafficking, Trinidad and Tobago is on the tier two list, and we are alongside countries like Haiti. This is where we are. We are standing with the worst countries. So that is what we see under this government. Social control has collapsed. I'm quoting from criminologist Darius Figuera. There is a tipping point in societies, and there is no going back. I think Trinidad and Tobago has already reached that point. This is um, criminologist Figuera. Today, we see very little to persuade us that Figuera's opinion is wrong. So they are saying that they can't see that he's wrong. And one of the, the, the other editorials, Daily Express, failing badly on crime. And I won't <clears throat> go into it as detailed as I did with The Guardian, but this is what it says. At the current rate of 1.55 murders a day for the year, Trinidad and Tobago is tragically on course to break the 2008 record of 547 murders. If the current trend holds, the number will exceed 560. As the body count rises, neither the police service nor the government is showing any capacity for mounting an effective response. These are the words of our newspapers and the editorials. 
and it goes on, it says here, the fact that just over 3,200 people have been murdered between 2016 and now is a devastating statistic that the government must face squarely. But how many editorials will we have to see like this before something is done? And this is where you, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, you have to come out and you have to make your voices heard. You have to rally behind the United National Congress. You have to rally behind our political leader. And we have to make sure and send a loud message that will ensure that Keith Christopher Rowley and the PNM will have to call an election, demit office, and you will get your chance to elect the United National Congress. I thank you very much. Because this is the revolution. The people's revolution. This is the revolution. I want to hear everybody sing. Everybody sing freedom, man and woman sing freedom. Everybody sing freedom. Everybody sing. As we move in this people's revolution, my brothers and sisters. Yes, brothers and sisters, our nation is suffering under arrogant leadership and bad governance. And to tell you more, our next speaker is a dedicated and determined member of parliament and a stalwart of the UNC. He continues to fight for the people of Kuva South as they rally for good governance. When he speaks, the PNM tremble. Please welcome to the platform the Member of Parliament for Kuva South, Mr. Rujanat Inersing. There is one. This revolution is about restoring our democracy. And this revolution is about stopping this creeping dictatorship. Welcome to the revolution. People crying out for justice. Thank you very much, Councillor Dubraj Pasad, political leader of the United National Congress and leader of the opposition, the Honorable Kamla Pasad Bisesa, my colleagues on this platform here tonight, my brothers and sisters at all levels of our great party, those of you who are listening on Radio Jagriti and looking on on TV Jagriti and have logged on to your so social media platforms wherever you are, a pleasant good night to each and every one of you. Trinidad and Tobago has collapsed under seven years of the government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. They have turned Trinidad and Tobago from a paradise into a nightmare. My brothers and sisters, in less than seven years where we are today, we are no longer experiencing the unparalleled and unprecedented development and transformation we witness under the leadership of Kamla Pasad Bisesa and uh, the People's Partnership Government. Uh, tonight, I want to tell uh, the missing in action Prime Minister Keith Rowley that the writing is on the wall. Uh, your government is on life support. Uh, your government is on a ventilator. And eventually, the people of Trinidad and Tobago will pull that life support that you ha are currently in receipt of. And I hope that the Prime Minister is not missing in action because he cannot move, because he has lost confidence in a special branch detail or the special branches that exist at the diplomatic center, my brothers and sisters. Come out of hiding. Be uh, like a man. Display the self-confidence and este esteem that is needed to lead Trinidad and Tobago out of this crisis. Because as leader of the opposition, you promised Trinidad and Tobago much. And Trinidad and Tobago has collapsed under your leadership over the last seven years, my brothers and sisters. You have betrayed. You have deceived. You have lied. You have displayed the worst sense of contempt and arrogance for the taxpaying citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, my brothers and sisters. Tonight, you have heard from my colleagues, crime is out of control. We are on track to break the 2008 record of 547 murders. My colleague, Dinesh Rambali, told you 14 murders over the weekend, 
and not a word from the Minister of National Security today when he conducted a press conference to focus on cable theft. And if there was a category in the Guinness Book of Records for the country with the most potholes in the world, Trinidad and Tobago will certainly be in the Guinness Book of Records based on the incompetence of Rowley and Rohan Sinanan and Faris al Rawi, my brothers and sisters. Healthcare has collapsed. We are now citizens are getting appointments two and three years. Elective surgeries, they have to wait two and three years and people are dying because they cannot get surgeries done in the healthcare system. And I immediately want to move into another arena here tonight because this government continues to disrespect the taxpaying citizens of Trinidad and Tobago with their arrogance and contempt. The Prime Minister is leading by example because he left this country for the summit of Americas and extended his stay at taxpayers' expense. And up till today, we do not know how much it has cost the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. What was the composition of his delegation? And uh, they sneak out or in and out of this country like if they are traveling with their private monies and their private purse. They have no sense of accountability to the people of Trinidad and Tobago who are funding their trips. And that leads me to a fellow by the name of one Stuart Young, who left this country like a thief in the night to meet one Al Asami, Tarek Al Asami, in Venezuela with the blessings of the Prime Minister, my brothers and sisters. Because apparently, Stuart Young, who poses as the Minister of Energy, but we know him to be Rowley's Deputy Prime Minister, or as I would call him, Rowley's number two, went out of Trinidad and Tobago very quietly. There was no announcement of this trip as official business anywhere in the, the media. There was no media release from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs advising the country that the minister would be out of, of our jurisdiction. And this is their track record because when they leave, when they sneak out of the country, you do not even know who is acting as minister in terms of line responsibility. And you would remember the minister of everything, the Gary Sobas of Keith Rowley government. That fella liked to chuck his mouth in every possible thing. But in relation to accounting to the people in terms of his visit, to into Venezuela, the fellow lost speech, his power of speech. Apparently, he too get pipped in relation to be able to provide us with some sense of accountability and transparency. So this government has a way of sneaking in and out of the country. And you would recall that Vice President Delcy came and sneaked into this country into the dark of the night during the pandemic to meet with Prime Minister Rowley. And now Stuart is sneaky Stuart is sneaking out to meet Nicolas Maduro. So you have to understand and I want you to look at this video very carefully in terms of the flippant behavior of the Prime Minister in terms of Vice President Delcy's entry into Trinidad and Tobago 24 hours after they were indicted by the U.S. State Department for narco trafficking and drug trafficking and money laundering. Prime Minister, was the government of Trinidad and Tobago concerned that the government has, had accepted at that time a visit by the Vice President of Venezuela 24 hours after Colleagues, officials, including the President of Venezuela, were indicted in the United States on drug trafficking, and narco trafficking, and corruption charges. Prime Minister. No, we had no concern like that. That is your Prime Minister telling you 
that he doesn't care about people being indicted in drug trafficking, narco trafficking, money laundering, and so on. And every day they want to berate the UNC and convince the population that the UNC have alliances with criminals and, and gang leaders and criminal elements in this country. But they do not care if they meet with drug traffickers and uh, persons. I have a bundle of documents that will show that indeed um, uh, this gentleman by the name of al Asami was indicted by the U.S. State Department, President Maduro. Maduro, too, is indicted by the U.S. State Department. And uh, this gentleman by the name of El Asami, Tariq Al Asami, was indicted by the United States Treasury Department on the 13th of February under the Foreign Narcotics Kingpin Designation Act, accused of facilitating drug shipments from Venezuela to Mexico and the United States. He was sanctioned by Canada. He was sanctioned by the European Union and Switzerland. And tonight, the UNC will not relent. We will continue to ask what was Sneaky Stewart's real agenda in visiting Venezuela. Was Sneaky Stewart accompanied by any officials from the Ministry of Energy? If so, then who? And then why not? Was Sneaky Stewart, where was Ed, did he invite our ambassador in Venezuela, Edmund Dillon, to this meeting? And did our Minister of CARICOM Affairs and CARICOM and Foreign Affairs, was he informed and aware of this meeting? Is it true that Sneaky Stewart's interpreter was denied entry into these meetings? If so, then why did the Venezuelan government block Minister's young interpreter from being there? And finally, I want to say to the Prime Minister, was it, was it you that President Maduro was ex expecting to come on this trip and Rowley decided that he was not going and he sent his number two? Is the Prime Minister who already got fully vaccinated for COVID-19 and who had already had COVID really in quarantine? Or was this an excuse the Prime Minister made up so that he will not go to Venezuela in terms of meeting with President Maduro. If you was there to talk about the Dragon Deal, tell us so. If you was there to discuss Venezuelan migrant-related issues, tell us so. But if you were not there for any of these issues, Sneaky Stewart, we, what were you there for to possibly talk with Al, El Al Asami? who is on the U.S. government wanted list. I am forced to conclude that birds of a feather flock together. And according to my friend, the Cuban boy from TikTok, it is plenty problems, boy. Plenty problems, boy. And that is what this government is confronting at the moment. And now I want to turn my attention to the Prime Minister all of a sudden found his voice in the last 24 hours and invited Michael and he said the General Secretary of the National Trade Union Center to a debate on women's issues and children's issues. I know the Prime Minister had to mentally stable and balance these days and he wants to descend into a debate. I want you to look at this clip here, this video, and this will tell you whether this Prime Minister has any care for women and children in Trinidad and Tobago. And a girl post like a woman. And a girl post like a woman. You got a groomer every day. No. <laughs> No. And a girl post like a woman. You got a groomer every day. Otherwise, it... that is how our honourable prime minister views women in terms of 
telling the country, insulting the women of our country, our beloved mothers and daughters and sisters, that women are like golf courses, that if you do not groom them, you have to put them out to pass here. I want to tell Prime Minister Rowley, you is the last man should be speaking on women's and children's issues in Trinidad and Tobago if you had any sense of decency. And charity begins at home. Probably Mrs. Rowley can tell us whether you have the right to speak on women and children's issues because it was you who was whining on Carnival on allegedly on, on an underage girl in San Fernando. Where was your care? Where was your care, Prime Minister, when a woman was sexually harassed at the Ministry of Sports? Where was your care for her pain, agony, and suffering? You supported the use of $150,000 of taxpayers' money, that's hush money. You convened a three-person committee headed by uh, industrial relations specialist, human resource specialist by the name of Jackie Wilson. And when that report was completed, you facilitated the suppression of this report. You sent that report for sanitization to the office of the Attorney General. And tonight, Prime Minister, I tell you, you are the biggest hypocrite in Trinidad and Tobago attempting to speak on women's issues. We must never forgive him because he attacked our leader in the most vile and vulgar ways when he used languaging that I do not want to repeat on this platform here tonight. And we must not tolerate his indecency and his vulgar conduct throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. Keith Rowley is the last person to be talking about treating women right because he should be just asked the special branch. And that the whole nation is fed up with your irresponsible acts and antics. And you must, the trade unions in this country must now form themselves into a special branch or a special unit and put sustained pressure on the government of Trinidad and Tobago to deal with all the outstanding industrial relations matters in Trinidad and Tobago. I want to tell you, Prime Minister, he who whips with words will be whipped with a special branch whenever a general election is called in Trinidad and Tobago, my brothers and sisters. And yes, uh, as you cannot deal with the pressure that you are getting from the unions, it is not Anisa's fault, it is your fault, it is your lack of leadership, it is your incompetence that have allowed negotiations to drag on for seven years. Under Kamla Pasad Bisasa, she could have repo reported as Prime Minister in five years that we settled 135 negotiations and found $5 billion to deal with back pay and outstanding issues. And just uh, as the union will sustain, we are calling for unity and sustained pressure. The United National Congress will not relent, will not relent on bringing the issues to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And just uh, as the people of Tobago have abandoned the People's National Movement, because now they are kicking, they are kicking Tobagonians out of their homes because of the fact that Tobagonians rejected the PNM. That is the spite, that is the hate, that is the malice they have for decent law-abiding citizens who are dear to the tenets of democracy. And uh, that is why I am telling you, Trinidad and Tobago, the writing is on the wall. Time is longer than twine, and whenever, whenever the elections are called, Rowley and the PNM must go. Long live the United National Congress under the leadership of Kamla Pasad Bisasa. I thank you. Welcome to the revolution. People crying out for justice.
Some of them crying out for freedom. freedom. Everybody crying out for democracy. Oh. Now it's time to take a stand. Yeah. Come on. Cause this is the revolution. Coming up next is the man of the people. He has a passion for the development of sports in Trinidad and Tobago and served as a coach to the Olympic athletes. A former minister of sports during the Kamala Prasad Bisesa administration, he is now the host of the hit show Dogla Politics. He is famous for boldly calling out the PNM for their mismanagement of our beloved nation and is a fearless advocate and on behalf of those who are ne neglected by this wicked PNM government. Please welcome to the UNC virtual platform, the one and only Senator Anil Roberts. <laughs> country looking for you never before in the history of Kamikom has a horn united a country against an evil divisive prime minister as has happened in the last 14 days Keith Rowley come down from there and come out a prime minister holds great power in a Westminster system the prime minister controls the lives of the citizens in every form of fashion this is why one must look at character development, education, heart, soul, family, life, pure faith to elect a prime minister. When you make a mistake and elect a man who does not have these qualities, then you have a problem. I thought today I was in the twilight zone in a movie because when I look at the Express newspaper and I see that Keith Christopher Rowley, yes, the very same Keith Christopher Rowley we know since 1969, could accuse a labor leader of impeccable character who has carried himself well for decades in the public view of not respecting women. I say, boy, we really reach. And the mass media put that forward to you as if that was some sort of debate coming from the mouth of Keith Christopher Rowley. Rowley attacked Michael Anisette on spurious, unsubstantiated nonsense on a Facebook post with the Prime Minister face with his name, Keith Rowley name. And he said that he, quoting Rowley, Rowley said, I am a public official who had to swear an oath of office. What have I ever, this is Rowley, not me, you know. this is Rowley, a little laugh, this serious thing, that man happened to be the prime minister. What have I ever done that would cause you to accuse me of disrespecting women and children? Well, Michael, and he said, might not have time for you, Rowley. <laughs> But I have all the time in the world for you. So I go drink medicine for Michael and he said, I go answer your question here tonight in full detail. First of all, in 1969, you were a teacher. A teacher is a position of high respect and honor. And you, sir, used that position to get pum pum from a girl of school age. And you impregnated that little girl. And you have a son now who must be about 53 years old, Gata Lane. That is not respectful. That is abusive. That is abuse of authority and power and trust, sir. In 2014, 2015, you were the leader of the opposition, a very powerful position in the Westminster system, a prime minister in waiting. And you went in the full glare of the public in San Fernando in South with everybody with their cell phones, with cameras, TV cameras, people in hot sun. 
and you held on to a 17-year-old girl for hour after hour without shame, live on TV, winding down the place while your wife and children and grandchildren were home watching it live, and you did not care? That is disrespectful, Keith Rowley. When you can, as a married man and an elderly married man, horn a woman and don't use a prophylactic and bring children after children into the world, not caring of the disrespect to that woman, not caring that the potential for disease, for STDs, for AIDS, for death, that you would take home to your beloved family. That is disrespect. I don't think you could be more disrespectful, Keith Christopher Rowley. And when you do that, I will continue to answer. And let us be clear, because I see Boti Rari Rive and some people trying to say Anil attacking Sharon. No, 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 no. Anil is on team Sharon. Enough respect, I do not judge. A woman of class, beauty, intelligence. And if she is happy, so be it. I'm not interested in her personal life whatsoever. I am interested in the people of Trinidad and Tobago and dealing with the miscreant, the degenerate that y'all made the mistake to elect. So don't say that Anil, Anil don't attack a woman at all, at all, at all. Now, let's deal with the issue. The issue is that Keith Christopher Rowley took an oath some 45 years ago. I wasn't in the wedding, but you all could check the date. And in that oath of marriage, Keith Christopher Rowley would have said words like this. I, Keith Christopher Rowley, take you, Sharon Clark, to be my wife, to have and to hold, to love and to cherish, to respect Till death do us part, according to God's holy law, in the presence of God, I make this vow. Then, for the next four and a half decades, this is what Rowley's horny goatweed tale of the tape has shown about this vow that he took. And keep in mind, this is a vow to someone he claimed to love, passionate, intimate, care for, protect. I am saying this to you to now think about what he would do to you. Three sitting cabinet female members right now. This is on the tail of the tape. Two female staffers from the OPM, some of them dipping in the chips in Tobago right on CCTV. Two high female government officers who preside over powerful positions. One former cabinet colleague's wife. One current female newspaper editor. One current female political journalist. Four current state board members and chairpersons. Three female constituency staff members. One 17 year old who then received a HCC house at 21 when there are 150,000 people waiting for HCC house with children. But she could whine better than y'all. One girl of school age while he was a teacher. That is the tale of the tape of the man who took this oath to be a good man under God's eyes. Then Keith Rowley took the oath of office to be prime minister because he lied on email gate, he lied on Calder Hart and Patrick Manning, he lied and attacked his own PNM colleagues to covet and to attain the job and the office of prime minister. And he took this oath of office. So if he wasn't able to uphold that oath, all you now understand why we are in the darkest times we've ever been in. Because somehow people dip their finger for a man who has no caliber, no character, no will, and stands for nothing. I, Keith Rowley, do solemnly swear, he said, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago and will uphold the Constitution and the law, that I will conscientiously, impartially, and to the best of my ability, discharge my duties as Prime Minister and do right to all manner of people. This man put his hand on the Bible and say that. Conscientiously, 
The man went AWOL for 27 days and tell all he taken medical tests, him go be sing rai rugby, black rambo and them say, if you take all the tests in the world, from your toenail to your hair follicle, it can only take two days. He take 27 days. And the media studying whether Kamala come to a Monday night forum. More holidays than any other prime minister in history. The laziest prime minister in history. He is playing more golf than go to cabinet meeting. More recusals as a prime minister than any other prime minister in history. They go Martin West, never see him in his constituency. When people flooding, he playing golf in the dry. Second, impartially. He took an oath to treat you, the people, impartially. Geographical discrimination on the radio today. People can't believe the roads they went down. PNM station, but they now venture out now. They get money to go and play in Rio Claro or somewhere. They can't believe. I tell them to drive in Princess Town, Naparima, drive down La Bray, drive in Coover in some of the back roads, drive in Tabaki, drive in those areas that MPs of the UNC are there, and you will see discrimination like never before. Impartially, he is partial. Open pyre cremation during the COVID-19 so-called fight that they lost and everybody died. Keith Rowley oppressed the Hindu religion and Hindu people in this country without science, without care, where they could not even send their loved ones off in the spiritual manner that they required. Rivers were closed while beaches were open. Doubles were shut down while KFC, you could have get your greasy chicken when you want. His divisive messages on Indian Arrival Day saying that Indians who came here under Fatal Razak signed the contract and made good terms. To the best of his ability, he was in his oath. Well, clearly he not able. Do the right thing to all manner of people was in his oath. He has suffered children. The Children's Life Fund created by Kamala Prasad Bisesa. He has stifled children. Children have died waiting for approval, being denied, and less than 10 children have received funding. Under Kamala Prasad Bisesa, 153 children's lives were saved. The Judith Jones report, December 13, 2021, rape, abuse, battery of children, not one action. He suffered the children. He cut gate from 726 million down to 300 million, from 59,000 students to 21,000. Cut school feeding, food in children, belly. Cut sport funding. He Attack labor while Kamala settled wage negotiations and paid back pay. He attacks labor, give them 2% and 4%, and then say the CPO, not the CPO, is Keith Christopher Rowley. Shut down Petro Train, 11,364 workers gone. TSTT, 700 workers and more coming. Wasa, 2,400 coming. Arcelor Metal, 600 workers gone. Point Lisa, 11 companies gone. MIC, NESC, UTT, Costat, he cut funding. CPEP workers. URP project, this man has suffered the entire country, but he swore on the Bible to take care of you. This is why elections have consequences. It's not about Horn, it's about Rowley being a miscreant who does not deserve to be the office of Prime Minister. <laughs> woman, he has taken women back a hundred years. It doesn't matter how smart our women are. For the last 30 years, the best SEA, CAPE, and CSEC students have been the girls. The girls have outshone the boys. But Rowley now moves us from scholarship to bursary. And to get a job in his cabinet, you have to pass Pum Pum his way. And to get a job as a board member, to get a contract to move forward, you have to give him something because he is sick. When the servicemen and women of this country have been disrespected by Rowley, he swore a Bible to respect and uphold them. Police, fire, lifeguards, army, coast guard, all treated with scant courtesy. They are the lowest level of morale ever. Healthcare workers and doctors, businessmen and women, forex, no taxes, more taxes, no foreign exchange, households, he's taken away the gas subsidy, food price inflation, and the elderly and all have suffered from inflation, late pension, NIS collapsing. And in his oath, he also said he will act without favor. Without favor, over 300 recusals. His small pin, Stuarty, what did Rudy and Dasim call him? Sneaky Stuarty. And his father, 
Daddy Small Pin and Brother Small Pin over five bubble billion dollars in 100 recusals. That's dealing without fear, without favor. That is showing favor to certain people, friends, family, and financiers. Noel Garcia is in charge of spending money and building airport, hospital, central block, every house, sports stadium, anything in this country. Noel Garcia of Las Alturas fame. And y'all have the audacity to call somebody else corrupt. Y'all have elected the most corrupt government in the history of the Caribbean. A.A. Komena, Gilbert Peterson, Central Bank Governor, I Ingrid Ashley, all Rowley's neighbors in Ainey's Gate. Imagine a Prime Minister showing favor, so much favor, that he puts people in charge of your money, that he could call them, say, hey, buy your own coffee, come and let me talk something. And you all find that's good governance and want to attack Kamala because she put on a mask to cook curry in a duck climb. All his neighbors at Ainey's Gate. And that's why I must sing from the icons and show you that what the people write, what the legends write, applies to Keith Christopher Rowley. The mighty shadow wrote in the horn a man crying. His lyrics rang out, and Rowley, this, you should write this and stamp this on your forehead. He used to be grinning. He ain't grinning no more. His face always sour. The horn a man crying. The horner man bawling. What goes around comes around. He used to be happy when he horned somebody else. Since he get a good horn, acting like a, no, a newborn, the big man getting on like a child, like he needs some tickle to make him smile. Somebody horn the horner man. The man start to slim down, all the muscles trim down. The tabanka rock him like sukuya suck him. Horn has united this country. Rowley is the most despised prime minister in our country's history. And he's become the single most ridiculed prime minister in the history of the Caribbean. A PNM fanatic, also a victim of Rowley's horny goat weed back in 2005, came up to me this week and he said, Anil, Rowley will sue you. He will sue you, boy. And I told him straight, one, you can't sue somebody for talking the truth. And secondly, and secondly, my lawyers, a few of them are here. We've already sorted out a list of witnesses to be subpoenaed if Rowley wants to sue me. Rowley, send it, boy. The dog is waiting. Send it for me. Send it. Make 10 copies. Because here the list, and this is just off the top of we you know. We ain't really dig deep yet. We subpoenaing Gata Lane, mother. Gadsby Dolly, Donna Cox, the mother of twins from Victoria Keys, the wife who eat your chips in Tobago, Jackie Lazarus, Bridget and he said George, Christine Kangaloo, Judy Raymond, Rhea Tate, the 17-year-old who now 25. And of course we must, we must subpoena Sharon Clark Rowley herself. So bring thing, boy, bring thing, Rowley. You're hiding in Tobago? Tobago done run here already. Now I want, as I go, I'm running out of time. I will dedicate this last song for you, Rowley. Because you're no stick break in your ears. And you break all over the place. But Rowley, you're broken. You're battered. You're bully. I never see a dictator so sad, so weak. Tabanka is real. Taranji Banji is real, Rowley. I leave in this one for you. It's a song by Lalman Maharaj. I want my people to get up and dance, boy. Because Rowley, the cat licked the butter. The cat licked the butter. The cat licked the butter, boy. I'm good lad watching. And if you squeeze me, you go feel the love We are one people under the sun One nation under the law So who feel the black? Who feel the white? I don't know But it's right till tomorrow night Who feel the wrong? Who feel the right? Come and go And all who feel the too bright Let me jump up let me wind up, party non-stop, 
Lama je dingo le kel ke te we come to play mass Every creed and class Don't let none pass La carreti ti ve all the love inside away First woman private minister First woman attorney general First woman to chair the commonwealth of 54 nations First woman opposition leader Welcome KPB Plus Solid everywhere La carreti ti ve all the love inside away Good evening all, thank you very much, thank you. Please have your seats, thank you very much. Well, it's good to be back with you and let's um, thank all those powerful speakers who came before me. Senator <laughs> Nakin, MP Darsing, MP, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, Senator Roberts, of course. <laughs> powerful, 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 thank you so much. MP Rambali, who also gave us a very strong contribution. To our two hosts, um, Alderman Marsha Jai Mangal, please give her a round of applause, and <laughs> Councillor Dubraj Pasad, thank you very much for headlining with us tonight. But before I get into some more serious business, I really want to say what a wonderful family day we had on Friday. I think everyone who was there loved every minute of it. And I was very happy spending that time. You know, say family time is the best time. And so we had a great time. You know, from the time you came off the highway, you could smell all the food coming out of the front splash. And um, the traffic was back right up to the traffic lights. And then on the actual junction by the schools there. So it was a massive event. Give yourselves a round of applause. And I want to thank all of you for making it possible for sharing us that wonderful evening. So let's just have a look at some of the scenes from that family day. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, give yourselves a round of applause. It was indeed a very wonderful day for all of us. And yes, we will do it again. So let's say congrats to all the winners of the various competitions we held on that day. I see Viliana is clapping loudly because she won, what was it? The Chow competition, San Fernando won the Chow competition. Um, the Pinal Davy Corporation won the curry duck. And then we had um, Choka, Shagona Swan. So give them a round of applause. Again, we've had a great uh, August month so far. Um, started with the cricket hosted by the Sabara constituency. That was a great success as well. Then we had the Emancipation Day celebrations hosted by Tap and Viliana and others in um, Marabella. And of course, this family day. So I look forward to seeing all of you this weekend as we kick off the football competition at the Center of Excellence on Saturday and Sunday. That's our next event. And we'll keep you informed of other events as we go along. And you know, it's great we come and we meet here and we talk and we share ideas and um, plans and of course our complaints and concerns, but it's even greater when we come together as a family and we share that camaraderie. And what I saw on Friday, apart from the food and the tasting of the food and the whole aroma and the ambience, was really the camaraderie. You could see the love and the friendship of the UNC family and friends on Friday. So again, let's give a round of applause to all those who participated and helped to make that day a success. So, in all of this, where is the missing Prime Minister? I wouldn't go down the road of some others who spoke before me. They shared their thoughts. Where is the missing Prime Minister? Is he okay? Is everything, is everything well with him? Because apart from the 27 days that Senator Anil mentioned, he's been missing for many other days as well. I'm told he showed up somewhere in Tobago sometime um, earlier tonight in Tobago in some event, but he has been missing for quite a time. And then somebody lied to the country. When we last met here on Monday, we had a consensus uh, view with respect to boycotting the local government meeting that the Prime Minister had summoned councillors to. And we took a decision, joint, I spoke with you before the meeting started, our people spoke with you. After the meeting, I shared one-on-one -on -one with you, and we took that decision, we will boycott the meeting. And we had good reasons for doing so. They've been saying the same things about the reform for years upon years upon years. They've done nothing. They've starved all our constituencies and um, really put the, the country through so much suffering in every sector. So we took that decision because we felt there was no useful purpose to attend that meeting, to listen to them do a PR gimmick, a PR stunt, to have everyone sitting there. I usually were like fowls in a yard. They summoned you. And then lo and behold, the Prime Minister boycotted his own meeting. He summoned everyone and he boycotted his own meeting. I cannot understand how that could happen. I didn't know I was so powerful. I called for a boycott and the Prime Minister boycotted his own meeting. <laughs> he listened to me. He boycotted his own meeting. Then they make heavy weather of one UNC council who turned up. He explained himself. I can't speak for him. He explained himself. That's a non-issue. Can you tell me how many PNM councils attended? Has anybody asked that question? Did the PNM councillors also boycott? Some of them boycotted. No, 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 they're not going down that road. They will not go there. They will ask people about why I was wearing my mask cooking curry duck down in um, Fun Splash. But they will not ask what Stuart Young was doing in Venezuela, meeting these people are narco traffickers indicted in the United States. They will not ask those questions. They will not ask Rowley where he was for 27 days. They know where he was, but what were you doing for 27 days? They will not ask the Minister of Energy, what were you doing in Venezuela? Did you go on a trip, a free trip? He has returned to this country and not once has he said what he went there to do. Not a report on taxpayers' dollars, yes. Nothing to tell the country. But they won't ask about that. 
They're worrying about why Larry Lala there and why Kevin Ramner ran. Wow, I was so happy to see so many UN speak. People, I have been issuing the call. Welcome home. Come back into the house of the rising sun. We have a lot of work to do. We have to come together. And persons heeded the call and they came. So you see how some fellas rolled sour grapes, eating up themselves. Look, just don't study them. Don't beat up. Just leave them there. But all those who wish to come back to work to help us remove this wicked government, most incompetent government, you say, come back home. Let's get together. Let's unite. Let's unite. So where is the Prime Minister? Others have spoken about his call and um, the audacity to call out uh, Michael Anissa, the trade union leader, to discuss about respect for women and children. Will you ever hear a thing like that? I mean, can you imagine... A person who has spent his entire life disrespecting women, who has treated our children in a worse manner. This is a man, remember, who took away the laptops, he took away the grants for the cerebral palsy, he took away the free kindergarten from children. He wanted to talk about, with Annie said to talk about, good treatment for the children. And then he doesn't care about women. And he'll go on his road, you heard him. I want you to hear Keith Rowley in his own words. Please run that video for me. In his own words. Not me, not Anil, not one of us here. These are the words of Keith Christopher Rowley wants to talk about respect for women and children. I choose my word very carefully. You could behave in a, as an effective opposition leader. I think the country is better for that. But geometry is not really the way to deal with these things. Kamala Prasad, Bissessa, and the UNC go and put that bill where the monkey put the nuts. You see these boots I'm wearing? We, the farmers of Tobago and Texas, we call them shit kickers, right? And I'm hoping that I'll meet Dr. Munilal today, but I haven't met him so far. Take it in your pooch. And I've got a person like a woman who got a groomer every day. Or a pooch east. I want to talk about party elites and meet him outside on the pavement. Bring him, bring her, it licks in the waist, licks in the waist, and licks all over the petty place. And then that, you call on the Prime Minister to do something about crime. I'm not in your bedroom, I'm not in your choice of men. That is tantamount to hugging up a porcupine to go to bed. Because I will tell you, like she loved you, like she loved me all the time. But I will tell you all something. Every month I get my salary, I work very hard for it. I am in no position to take one dollar. I want every cent I work for and I want it on time. The last time I was put out of anywhere for anything, the person who put me out regretted it. Sucking from the nipple of the Prime Minister, figuratively. Figuratively. To rape us with an umbrella. And worse to open the umbrella. And she could jump high, she could jump low. She could drink this, she could drink that. She could back in the door, we can bring no shit down. And you will see government ministers who came into office looking like Miss Howard Chat. Prime Minister, I'd like to take the conversation to a more social round, the social climate. You look on social it's media. It's Christmas time, we should have some drinks then. Well, perhaps um, of the non-alcoholic flavor. Well, that is not drink. And if I have to go to jail as a result of not responding to you in 14 days, come, I'm ready to go. I'm coming to the conclusion that it's all about respect. All about respect. If we're raising children, boys and girls, we start there to teach them to respect. And if we're in the workplace or if you're on the street talking to strangers, it's about respect. It's just shut your mouth and let you learn to be able to strive. That is respect from the Prime Minister, Keith Christopher Rowley. And therefore, I think in our country now, the danger, the biggest danger facing us is not the COVID, it is not the monkeypox, the biggest danger is Rowley and his government. It is the PNM pandemic of hopelessness that we are facing. 
The greatest threat to our country is a prime minister who has no compassion. He has no vision for a country or for our citizens. I want to tell him, you have lost all authority to run our country. Call elections now. Call elections now. Which prime minister governs over failure in each ministry as Rowley has done and is doing? None. Not any other prime minister. Which prime minister allows over 200 cabinet recusals as Rowley has done? And none. No other prime minister. Which prime minister allows murders to escalate, crime to run rampant like Rowley has done? None. None. None has done that. Which prime minister abandons citizens as he has done in a cost of living crisis? None. No other prime minister. Rowley has abdicated his role as prime minister. He is leading a band of political misfits. They are abusive and cruel and they have no compassion for the people of this country. Never before has a leader mismanaged a country causing so much damage, despair and destruction. This week, they marked their two years since their re-election in office. And today they have taken us off the promised roadmap to recovery. They placed us firmly on a roadmap to ruin. In seven years, under Rowley, our energy sector has gone dead. Petrogen has gone. Many of the energy um, businesses have fizzled out, gone. In seven years, fuel subsidy gone. In seven years, flour gone up, oil gone up, crime gone up. TT is losing its heart and soul because of Rowley and his wicked, incompetent government. So let's, let's talk about something real. You brought the Venezuelans to Trinidad and Tobago. You didn't bring them. You accepted them. You gave them license to stay in Trinidad and Tobago. So before I talk about young and Venezuela, I want to talk about the plight of the migrant children who are here. It is about time we allow these children to enter our public school system to get an education. I am calling on government to let the Venice children get an education, let them go to school. When our people go abroad, what happens? They get to go to school. It is not their fault. They are not criminals. In the US, in the UK and elsewhere, they are allowed to go to school. And we should do the same. We should allow these children fleeing Maduro to get an education. So I'm extending it to say any migrant child here, not just the Venezuelans, any migrant child in Trinidad, no matter nationality, should be allowed to enter school, kindergarten, primary, secondary, come September when the schools reopen. We have three weeks to the new term. That is enough time to get them registered and allow them to get requisite inoculations, vaccinations, and so on, as they may need. So I'm calling on civil society. And in fact, I want to thank civil society. I want to thank the CBOs. I want, I want to thank the FBOs, the faith-based organizations. All these organizations who run schools, who've been trying to support the migrants, and so on. We want to thank them and to ask them again to continue to do as much as they can. But I say to the government, it is your duty. Imagine if it were your child as a migrant in somebody else's country they should not be deprived of an education. So I call for government to let the Venezuelan children and other migrant children get an education. We must always do right by our children and any children whatsoever. <laughs> so, on the children, you know my heart has always been with the children and for the children. Anil mentioned about the, um, the children's life fund. You know, I will not forget, we had written to, um, Faris Alwawi when he was the age, because there was a child who was trying to access the children's life fund. And when the correspondence went from the people who run the life fund to ask the AG if according to law this child will be caught and captured to get help. I don't mean captured physically, who will be caught within the legislation to get help from the children's life fund. That man never, never, never responded to the queries from the authorities, and you know what happened? The child died. The child died because that attorney general did not take the time to see that it was a child asking for help on their life. And I want to promise you tonight, when you put us back into government, we'll amend the children's life fund. It was we, we put it in place in the first time, 
And I remember in that cabinet there was one minister. Anil will remember he was in that cabinet. Indar Singh was um, a junior minister, but he was part of the government. One cabinet minister, I remember we campaigned in the 2010 election. We will establish this children's life. Fund. And one minister looking at me in the face and telling me, we cannot do that. We cannot do that. I said, but you are mad. We have to do it. We took all the cakes and the big scales and the suffering. The parents have to go through because they cannot afford to save the life of their child. The minister said, no, 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 no. We'll open the floodgates where we did not. We passed the law. We put it in. The floodgates did not open, did not close, and we were able to help so many children. We didn't open floodgates. We were helping children. And so I promise you tonight, I promise you, when you put, back, put us back into government, we will amend the law to take up where the loopholes are to ensure that our children are taken care of. That is why we built the Coover Children's Hospital. We built a state-of-the-art children's hospital, and these wicked, malicious people, PNM, Rowley's PNM, refused to open that children's hospital. In that way, the Children's Life Fund would have cost us less monies because that hospital was built that we could take care of them right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Wouldn't have to find Forex, would have been able to care for them. Over 2,000 jobs would have been created in, for that hospital. You have people all over qualified, can't get a job. When you had a state-of-the-art building built by the People's Partnership to take care of the children, to provide jobs, and you know what? To also get foreign exchange because others from the CARICOM would have come here to bring their children. But they didn't see it. Malicious and spiteful because it was a UNC-built partnership project. They will not open it. It took the COVID pandemic. It took a pandemic for them to use it as a step-down facility, not even as a full-scale hospital. So they're hypocrites. And you want to talk about respecting women and children? When you disrespected all those children who could have been serviced, and the women, we had a wing for women there too, they would have been taken care of at that Coover Hospital. You want to tell Annie, said, but come and discuss. Discuss? Come and talk what with you. You are a total hypocrite and a waste of time as a Prime Minister. A total hypocrite. So they are trying to use distractions to change the narrative. I don't know who they got in some newspaper, a two-year-old non-story making about one of our MPs something about a car. When Ferris transferred his car to, to what the boy named Kewal Singh, years later, up to now, there is no record of a, a legal transfer in the license office unless you all went and put it in after. The check that was supposedly paid, that check was never stamped with a bank stamp. They did it after the fact when we started to raise the question. Why doesn't the media ask about those things? Why don't you ask about the Rohans, what they call it, a Maybach, is that the name of it? Yeah. I think he transferred that, or he's tra he transferred one to somebody who? Some contractor. Why don't you ask about that? You come with a non total, non story, non issue to raise that as a distraction when you're just raging up. People are so fed up of you and your lies and all your false narratives. Nobody is even taking that story on. Nobody is even taking it because there's nothing in it. There was nothing illegal in, what, in that transaction. And tonight I vouch for that. And I call upon the government, if you're acting to charge a man, charge a man. We have plenty lawyers in the UNC, you know. Good lawyers too. We have many good lawyers. I see Andrew walk with his lawyers tonight too. So look, why do you do this? They just do these things in nasty people's names, you know. Not one of substance in, in that story. Two years ago, that story was floating all over the world. You, why did you come with it now? Because why? You can't handle. You can't handle what is happening to you. You can't handle it. Hiding. Hiding. And so we come back now to Stuart Young and Maduro and meeting with these people, narco-traffickers, indicted as they are. Rowley sent his personal caddy boy, former National Security Minister Stuart Young, go meet this man notorious for being a drug trafficker. Venezuela appoints, as an article of Reuters, Venezuela appoints alleged drug trafficker El Asami as oil minister. And this is what the article says. In March, the U.S. Justice Department Charge El Aisami and 14 other 
current and former Venezuelan officials with narco-terrorism, corruption, and drug trafficking. That article continues, El Asami's indictment said he violated U.S. sanctions. He received payments for facilitating drug shipments. The Trump administration announced a reward of up to $10 million for information leading to the arrest of El Asami. And this is whom our Minister of Energy, who is like, as I said, the Caliboy to Rowley, the second in command, flies off to Venezuela, or whichever way he got to Venezuela, what are you doing me to these people? What business does Rowley and his minister have to do with drug traffickers? What business do they have? Tell people, you say it's about energy. Well, what about energy? What energy deal did you come back with? For seven years, you have met with Maduro. Not one single energy deal. There's not a single energy deal producing energy to the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is clear that Stuart Young and Rowley have no shame. They have no duty. They have no sense of responsibility to our nation because they're single-handedly destroying energy sector and crippling our economy. And what is worse, you are putting all of us into a zone where we could be sanctioned by the U.S. Let us not be, um, let us not forget that, you know. That's a serious matter. And I want to say tonight, we wash our hands of all of that kind of dealing with Rowley and, and whoever. We in the UNC. And if there should be any sanctions against us, it should be against Rowley and Stuart Young and those people. Not the whole of Trinidad and Tobago. And definitely not the UNC. And now, Young is putting every business in TNT at risk. If that wasn't bad enough, they want to rub salt in the wounds of citizens by, as I say, risking sanctions. Mr. Young, oil and gas production has fallen to the lowest under you. Why are you meeting with Maduro? You have nothing to offer Maduro, and Maduro has nothing to offer us. So tell us, what was your meeting about? Five years ago, Rowley was doing a conga line with Maduro. You remember that? The conga line in Venezuela. They told us that the dragon gas was coming five years ago. It never came. So what can you be meeting Maduro about at this time? With all so many cabinet recusers against his name, we know Young is selfish, cares about himself. But this latest move proves Young is senseless and reckless. Stuart Young, you're putting every business in TNT at risk because if we are sanctioned, all will be impacted, all these businesses. And now, today I saw the most jokey thing happen. I didn't too long, you know, because it was just like total waste of time. Over this weekend, 72 hours, over 14 persons have been murdered. Under the Rowley regime, over 3,200 persons have been murdered. Over the last so many days, we did, the, the number of murders is more than the number of days in the year. So murder is, is just out of control, totally out of control. And instead of dealing with this role, he chose and said to try to square off with a union leader. Look at, so they call a press briefing. I, well, I'm, I'm very interested, this national security minister. So I thought he was going to address the state of crime. I think MP Rambali spoke a lot about that earlier. But lo and behold, they come to talk about ban on scrap iron. Something they told us last week already, but call this emergency press briefing to just say the same thing they had said last week. Ban on scrap iron. And I was told that he refused, the ministers refused to answer any question except about scrap iron. Murders all time high, but no questions about that. No solutions, no policies, no programs, and instead, only scrap iron. Only scrap iron. This after they've converted all of Petrotrin in a scrap yard. That's a scrap iron heap they have there. I don't know what they will do with it because it doesn't seem that anybody's going to, 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 to come and take it, buy it from them. So Rowley is really, he's not bothered, he couldn't be bothered. When all the editorials today, as I think MP Rambali mentioned him, all the editorials are coming out against the crime wave. And all that Raleigh is doing, people are saying about him, he's just crying 
because the entire country is laughing at him and he's not doing his job. We all have problems, you know, Mr. Rowley, but we don't drop everything and go and hide. You have a job to do, man. Do your job. And if you cannot do it, then get out. Call the elections now. Call the elections now. It is your responsibility to protect people. That is one of the, the key points of any government, the protection of its citizens. That is your first function. In days of old, you didn't have a government in this man like a central government. In days of old, if you the lords would fight each other, pick up your sword, your knife, your... And in the days when guns came, and each one would be a big bad baron on their own, would be in charge of an area, and would fight down each other, and so on. Those days are gone. You are a government elected by the people, for the people, and of the people. And your first duty is to protect the people of your country. You have miserably failed to do that. Let me remind you, Rowling, of your words when you were opposition leader in 2012. I quote, if the government cannot deal with it, crime, then the government itself is part of the problem. This is Rowling. If the government cannot deal with crime, then the government itself is part of the problem. So who is the problem now? Keith Christopher Rowley. It is your government. You and your hapless, hopeless bunch of misfits. You are the problem. You came some time ago, you found some new words, you probably Googled it or somebody told you, Chief, these are the new buzzwords. You know, you have to use these words. This crime thing is really what is it? A public health emergency. When I spoke to you some time ago, I told you this has been a concept around for a long time now. But this man just probably got somebody to Google it for him. And since there's nothing, 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 nothing. This famous set of words, public health emergency, nothing. It's gone the way of all flesh on the Rowley. That is to say, what has happened to the Justice you own report? I heard one of you mention it tonight. What became of that report? Big hue and cry on the front page, back page, every page. Go on to call up the Sabga report from way back when and what? What has happened? You put a task force, have they reported, have they said what is the plan of action? Nothing. What has happened when your men shut down the little children and the boat, the little Venezuelans? Where's that big inquiry? Where's it gone? Big inquiry report. Like everything else, he names committees, do things, and we never hear about it again. We never hear about it again. Well, I want to know what has happened with Justice Jones' report. I want to know what has happened with your inquiry with those children that were shot in a boat, totally undefended. What has happened? All the hue and cry. What is the position with the divers? The divers off here. What has happened? Yes, well, what has happened to the Commission of Inquiry? How long is it now? As I said, the trail gets cold. The longer it's there, it gets cold, and you will not be able. No justice, no care. It is no care. This government is not about justice. They are about themselves only. And so I say, Mr. Hines, Minister Hines, I think the time has come for a sensible Minister of National Security to be appointed. <laughs> Heinz is incapable of doing his job. I don't make this as a political statement, per se. This is a statement of fact. He's incompetent. I call on business, civil society, labor, media, to come out and tell Heinz, go. Heinz must go. He must be removed. This affects all of us, regardless of political affiliation. Today, it's someone else's child being murdered. Tomorrow, it could be yours. And therefore, we have a collective responsibility to get Heinz out of that job as National Security Minister. <laughs> Today, two senior ministers called a press conference. I told you to talk about the copper wire. 357 murders in 227 days. Every 15 hours, someone is murdered. 14 murders in 72 hours. And Heinz and Reggie Limo also known as Forgetful Jones. What are you talking about? Copper wire. Look at this clip. Look at this clip and see what's going on in our country. It is worse than the Wild Wild West. Look on. Look. Yeah, that is on Levanti Road. Yeah, I saw the gun, sir. So. Are you sure why you have a gun? You're going to do? We should generate them. Thank God. Yeah. Are you sure what you want to do? We should all over. What do you have to do? Go 
Oh, Granny, you are going to go down quick, baby. Good boy. There's gunfire all over in Port of Spain. That's just one. There are many other clips that I'm sure you're seeing. And so it's so shameful, so pathetic. Reggie Limor has become. His entire reputation has been destroyed. He has been exposed as an incompetent minion. Reggie Limor was always a pathetic person, but was just propped up by the PNM propagandists and eater food grovelers. He has now been exposed. This presser, with shameless lime or shameless Heinz, was an insult to the people of our country. Heinz and Lima stubbornly ignored urgent concerns about the over overflowing blood of our citizens, instead talking about the copper wire. This is the crisis that they are concerned about, while thousands have died under the Rowley Watch. This is a deliberate waste of our time, country's time. Just, you know, they want to make it look like they're doing something. Call a big press conference, play by John, and you're doing well. And by the way, that law, did you consult lawyers? I mean, real lawyers, not Reggie Limo. Can you really pass a law in that manner? Or do you need a certain kind of majority to do what you did? I'll ask the UNC lawyers to look at it for me. Because I suspect that in your rush to make it appear that you're doing something, you put a dunce lawyer, a lying lawyer, Reggie Amo, or Limo, to do your work. So let's see what will happen with that. Again, I see that press conference was a desperate, pathetic move from both men. I don't know if you could even call them men after that, after such a pathetic showing in terms of taking care of people. So whilst we complain, I, let me just share with you some of the things we had said before. Just spend time. I say we can't just come and complain. We must have some ideas and some solutions. Protecting people, this should be a government's priority. The opposition has put forward numerous suggestions to government to tackle this issue. The record will show that the UNC is the only party when in government was able to bring crime down. <laughs> only party. Under the government I led, we maintained a zero tolerance approach to crime. We brought serious crime down to the lowest in not one year, not one decade, the lowest ever in three decades, in 30 years, <laughs> under my watch. We had a holistic approach, legislative measures, non-legislative measures, infrastructural works, social and educational programs. I remember with um, Jill and John, we had started a program because we realized that the young people out there, and they had nothing to do, and that is part of the problem in fighting crime. It's not just about um, one shot, one kill, or whatever. The young people need something to do. You've displaced so many people from their jobs. The young people are displaced from jobs as well. What we did, we, we started a program. It was called Color Me Orange, where we took all those young people up in the north, in Port of Spain, and Levante, and elsewhere, where they had no jobs to go to, and we created the Color Me Orange program, where we took these young people and gave them jobs to work in the housing sector, uh, with the HDC, is that correct, um, JJ? Which HDC? <laughs> and so, there are answers. Uh, JJ, I won't go there tonight. I'll leave it for you. Um, well, of course, they killed that and killed every other program. They've killed all the white tip, all the um, learning centers we had on administrative tertiary education. All those places where young people could have gone, get trained to do a job. And for those who've been trained, well, you have killed jobs in this country. They have nowhere to even go and get a job. So the record will show we brought, as I say, serious crimes down to the lowest in 30 years, three decades. Under this government, under the government I led, we took, as I say, that holistic approach. We believe that improving education, providing better economic opportunities for families and the young ones, those were keys to helping end violence in our communities. And these are what must be addressed in order to reduce crime. So all this fancy word of public health emergency and so on, please don't fool nobody with that. Total waste of time again. It is not about that empty declaration, you know. It has no plan. When they asked the man when he made the big announcement, he couldn't give you any details about what this was. And how many weeks later, still no details. I want to remind you the government I led, we made adv advancements in building an integrated national security 
coordinating apparatus. We strengthen the legislative framework. We strengthen the judicial system and law enforcement agencies. We had a plan then to build on those achievements and to continue the thrust to safeguard children, family, and communities. Our focus was on improving efficiency of law enforcement, policing, and border control. This government is so evil, this rowley p &M, heartless. They lied about all these programs and dismantled them, all so they could be in power. When you really think about it, they sacrifice the lives of our population, our young men, our women, our children, so they could stay in power. There's nothing more satanic than that. So look at the evil they've unleashed. When the UNC returns to government, I want to tell you we will again move to address the root causes of crime. Poverty, inequality, lack of opportunities for young people, we will again address those to bring the crime down. We believe in investing in people through education, training, jobs, and equality in opportunities. We will work with the TTPS to roll out our plan for continuous training, improving crime detection, and ensuring crime prevention. Pre prevention. We will reintroduce community policing, ensure police presence, implement other strategic actions for a systematic, drastic reduction in crime within defined target dates and time frames. We will focus on more boots on the ground, ensuring the TTPS is equipped to be present, effective, and responsive in all communities. We will look at utilizing the Debe campus again because of the spite and the malice and the ill will of the Rowley p &M, they have failed to open that massive, I mean, state-of-the-art Debe UWI campus. Still there. That's gone anyway. We will open it. We will ensure we open it so children will have those opportunities. And what we will do, we'll utilize part of that Debe campus for the training of our protective services. And we will also... Uh, have established a new dual purpose training facility for forensic science that we can establish there at that DB campus. So train protective services and dual purpose with training for forensics. We desperately need that. Now a lot of the things that we do here, we have to send it abroad, send it abroad, send it abroad. Is that true, MP Dinesh? Yeah, we, we don't have that. We had said that we would do it, and when you put us in government, we'll do it. That will go a long way in helping us to solve crime. So that facility will be a trading and working facility in evidence processing, similar to what we did with the new teaching hospital model. We will also split again the Ministry of National Security into two ministries, because it's clear that it's just too much for one minister to handle. They had made a song and a dance that we had too many ministers, blah, blah, blah. By the time they're done, I think they have more ministers than we have. We had. Remember how they complained? We had too many ministers. But it's a massive workload. So we'll split the Ministry of National Security into a Ministry of Defense and a Ministry of Home Affairs. Two separate ministries with various. And then we will also reintroduce the Ministry of Justice. You saw where Rowley recently blaming the judiciary for the backlog of the cases and so on. Ministry of Justice will focus on the justice system, administration of justice. Ministry of Home Affairs will deal with the TTPS, with home affairs and homes, home affairs and home security. Ministry of Defense is a Coast Guard. They will look at the border control, border protections, and so on as a Ministry of um, Defense. So each arm will have its work cut out. In that way, you can get more done, have a more efficient system um, going forward. And of course, then you will have the Office of the Attorney General will be dealing also with those areas under that portfolio. So these are clear initiatives to have a positive impact in reducing crime. And I think our citizens more than deserve to live in peace and be confident to go about their daily lives free from fear. And therefore, it is imperative, I say again, that we come together, we work together, we unite together to remove this incompetent, lazy government. They must go. We have to get them out. Because the day will come when there will be no one left. And believe me, there will come a day if we do not move this wicked government, there will be not a voice left to be raised against them. You have seen how they slap down anybody who has a different opinion from them. Buff everybody about everything, but yet they are so totally incompetent. And we approach now to budget time again. 
and they will come again with their budget propaganda. I want to put you on notice. Be aware of the budget propaganda that they will come with soon. For seven years, they have not delivered a single job. In fact, they have taken away thousands and thousands of jobs have been lost. For seven years, foreign direct investment has dwindled away in this country. For seven years, foreign exchange has withered away. After seven years, they have spent $390 billion. And what do they have to show for it? They have nothing to show for that $390 billion. Every budget time, however, they come to you with the same lies. They come to pretend the economy is improving. They come to pretend the economy is turning around. You hear a lie? Every budget is lie upon lie upon lie. We have not had a single year of economic growth under the Israeli government. Not one year, Taka, is that true? Not a single year of true economic growth. Oh yes, and COVID, always blame COVID. Blame COVID, blame Kamala. Blame Kamala, blame COVID. I will never accept responsibility for their own incompetence. So look, don't let them chain you up. Economic growth, I want to remind you, stopped long before COVID. That is reminding me, what is it, COVID? But that happened before COVID. That, remember, COVID didn't crush the economy, you know? Rowley and his PNM crushed the Trinidad Tobago economy. Remember that, so don't let them fool you with their propaganda. No growth 2016, no growth 2017, no growth 2018, no growth 2019, no growth 2020, and then they'll do something with the maths, how to lie with the maths. Remember last year I told you the maths not matching? They will come back again to cook the books. And the maths will not match in order to try to fool us again. So not a single year of economic growth. And you know what has grown? One thing has certainly grown. Lies upon lies and upon lies. And crime upon crime upon crime. That is under the Rowley administration. The mistrust in public office has grown. The obscene recusals to benefit friends, benefit friends and family and finances have grown. Every single year, right before budget, they come with their Nancy stories to fool us. Young will come and tell us, more gas coming. More gas coming when gas production is the lowest ever on the Rowley. On the Rowley and Stewart. You will hear Paula Gopi Schoon come to talk about more investments being made in industry and manufacturing. Look, Paula. Paula, I don't believe you have even delivered a new paper bag for this country. So don't come to talk about investments. One year she came to talk about a bubblegum factory. You all remember that? Well, maybe this year she tell us she's setting up a paper bag factory. We'll wait for it. Minister of Finance, he will come in a few days. He will tell us about new growth, new revenue, blah, 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 blah. Seven years and repeat, repeat, repeat. Mr. Imbert. Yeah, after year, you promise to turn around. You say, you can see clearly now, you are remember that famous. You can see clearly things getting better, the rain is gone and so on. Yet, you have crashed all revenue streams in our country. I call on citizens not to fall in their budget propaganda narrative. Don't fall for their political mama guy. The real story before your eyes, joblessness rampant. Flooding rampant. That is becoming a national crisis as well. More parents than ever desperate as they cannot afford to send children to school for the new term. Businesses are shutting, businesses shutting. Now let me compliment our MB Lee, who gave out some um, school supplies recently. And I compliment all our MPs and senators and um, councils, all the men who have been working to help the children to go back to school with school supplies. So thank you all very much. You yes, I gave it Marabella recently. Thank you for reminding me, Tahaka. You were very much in attendance, so thank you. So all of you, please continue. A couple of weeks ago, before schools open, let's try and give whatever little bit we can. A lot of requests are coming in, and we may not be able to fill all, but each one plus one plus another. Let's help as we can the children. We have figures now from our communities. Under Rowley, the suffering has increased. And so we say, Prime Minister Rowley, enough is enough. Call the elections now. <laughs> Come out of hiding. Where are you hiding? Come out of hiding. Call elections. 
I have a few announcements to make before I close. First, last week we announced the opening of um, nominations for persons who want to be councillors in the local, upcoming local government elections. Again, the nomination forms are available at the headquarters here. You can come and get them. This uh, time for local government, um, the party, has take, the executive has taken a decision that we will invite applications for persons who wish to be all the men in the various corporations. We also have forms here at the headquarters that you can collect and fill out. Now, before the selectors and all the men, people tell us you worked well, you've been helping a lot, you're a good person to make an alderman. But I think it is, it is only fair that all those who wish to serve as aldermen be given a chance to make an application and then we can screen you in the same way we screen for the councillors. I think that is a fair process. So I'm inviting all those who wish to serve as aldermen to kindly collect your forms here and fill out that application. Now remember, if you have applied to be a councillor, you cannot be an older man. Because the way the law is, the same time, the nominations are sent in on the same day, nomination day, nominations are sent in for persons who wish to be councillors. On that same day, we have to send in the list of persons proposed to be older men. So you will have to make a choice. You cannot wait until nomination day, and if you're not chosen, you want to become an older man. You have to choose, I want to be screened as an older man, or I want to be screened for a counselor's job. So all forms are available here. Please um, collect them. This weekend, I mentioned it before, football weekend. And um, I look forward to seeing many of you here as the party organizes another um, round of activity. We have several football experts, I think Senator Nakir and Senator Annie Roberts. I think Senator Damien sometimes does kick a ball as well. And all the rest of us who want to, to take a try, please come out. The details are on my Facebook site. They are on the party side. So please check it out. Get your teams ready. It's eight persons per side, per side, and you have to register before. And tonight, I spoke about local government, and I want to call on government to do something that is very important, and I will repeat, and we will repeat this call every time we speak. You remember during the last elections, we called for international and CARICOM observers, and the government refused to bring any observers for that election. The rest is history. You saw what happened in Ghana. And thank God for those observers who were there. When all the bacchanal was happening with the results and so on, they were very strong. In particular, our sister from Barbados, Mia Motti, was very strong as part of the CARICOM observer team in those elections. So tonight, I call on government to ensure, and start now, you have time, that we get CARICOM observers for that election, and we get international observers for that election, because we don't trust you. We do not trust the ABC. And we will make every step we can, even if we have to appeal internationally to expose the fact that you do not want observers, and we know how that goes when you hide everything from the population. And we already have serious concerns with that EBC. So, Please join me in this call. We should all make this call for CARICOM observers and for international observers. So now I told you, um, I just recall, you know, we talk so much and thoughts just fly into your brain and so much we want to tell you. So I said somebody lied to the country and I started talking about the, um, concert, the, the workshop or whatever it is, the Prime Minister and Faris and they were having, I invited all the councillors and whatever. And Faris came and he said that, um, Prime Minister boycotted because we were boycotting. And then the next day or two days later, we read a post put out by the, by, by the Office of the Prime Minister where they said, well, he's now um, restricted, restrictions from COVID have lifted as of Thursday. So what was going on on Tuesday then? When Faris told us that the Prime Minister boycotted because the UNC boycotted when he was still under COVID restrictions, if we had to believe the post thereafter. So somebody is lying and it is me. It has to be one of them. And that's what they do with us all the time. They change the goalposts, they move the goalposts each time to lie and to save face. So my fellow citizens, we know times are tough. We know economy is facing the worst crisis ever. We know citizens live in fear. Violent crime is overtaken, has overtaken us. 
We have a government that steals from citizens, led by a prime minister who appears to have abandoned his job. Our nation is in collapse. Now more than ever, we must stand together, we must hold firm. We must remember that the UNC rescued our nation when the PNM wrecked it before, and we must be prepared to do it again. Our nation is sick under this rowdy regime. We need to put the UNC into office. And so I ask you, are you ready? Will you stand with the United National Congress? Yeah. Will you unite and join so we can remove this government? And let our rallying call be always call elections now. Call elections now, Rowley. Call elections now. UNC and proud. UNC and proud. I thank you all so very much. Thank you. So who feel the black? Who feel the white? I don't know. But in Saturday tomorrow night, who feel the wrong? Who feel the right? Come and go. And all who feel the too bright. Let me jump up. Let me wind up. Patin and stop. Ramaje Dingo Lekel Kete, we come to play mass. Every creed and class. Don't let none pass. Black Arati TV, all the love inside the way. Up tongue and ghetto. Feeling the tempo. So current I so. It's party they like so. Soon as we land, fun is the plan. We like the jam, like the man bam. Waving the hand inside the band, we inside the band. And if you cut me, you go see blood. And if you squeeze me, you go feel the love. We are